Hi everyone, welcome on um, this graveyard shift, like we tend to call it. <laughs> um, you guys are the real heroes here because you're still around and you're in a class which is going to take 90 minutes of hopefully awesomeness. Um, actually, graveyard shift is something that comes from New Orleans. It's originated here in the early 19th century. I have a problem in pronouncing that word. Uh, there was like a yellow fever uh, that hit the city and about 40,000 people died. So they had to bury them as quick as possible uh, during the day. And they had the habit to put a ring on their finger, on their index finger. So if they were like still alive, then they could be saved by the bell. And the guys that were doing that work, they did it overnight with a lantern walking around on the graveyard to see if there were people still alive. And that's where we got the graveyard shift from. But that's, that's not the idea of today's session. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to keep it a bit lighter. And um, my name is Dieter. I'm Jacob. And we're going to talk to you about neighborhoods and how we can optimize it with generative design. So we also have this, the safe harbor statement. Here you go. <laughs> so uh, my background is actually structural engineering, although we are going to talk about an architectural subject. And I like to use it, my structural engineering background to do a bit more of the analysis thing, analytical things in uh, generative design. So that comes in very handy. I'm very passionate, passionate at least, about generative design. And uh, yeah, happy to talk about this again. Uh, at AU, uh, and in the meantime, I'm already eight years at Autodesk. And tell me about you, Jacob. Yeah. So I'm an uh, architecture background, um, but uh, very technical focused. Uh, background uh, led me very quickly to Dynamo and generative design, um, and uh, very, very happy to get my hands on helping people automate all the, the things and make better decisions faster, uh, which is what it's all about. I've uh, been with Autodesk for about four years now. So the way how we are going to teach this class is a bit interactive. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the high level stuff of this workflow uh, that we want to present to you. And Jacob is going into the technical deep dive part of uh, the products with some uh, exciting live demos. So bear with us that nothing crashes and that everything runs properly. Now, at the end of the class, you will also get a slide which is showing you where to find all the content because right now you cannot see any content from us except a PDF showing that there is no content available yet. <laughs> uh, so it's a good reason to stick around until we are done. So yeah. Um, now the learning objectives. Uh, what is this? What we are going to do in the first step? Building oh, the script? Yeah, we're going to learn how to build a graph so that generative design can come up with a dwelling layout optimized. Like, we want to be able to get that content on the site and figure out if it's good. Yeah, and you should normally, after this, be have, well, you will have learned about the value and the positioning as well of these products Dynamo, Spacemaker, uh, Revit. You will see also why, how, and when we are using Spacemaker in this specific story, because it's a bit of a customized workflow that we're going to show you. And, uh, well, generative design is going to be used in here as like the main part of it, of the workflow. So it will be like a bit of the backbone. Now, this is the agenda, quite intensive. Lots of topics to discuss, um, but it will be worthwhile. First part is the industry context. So I need to give you a bit of a background on why did we make this kind of a workflow? And what, what is the challenges that we see globally uh, in the industry of neighborhood planning and so. Now, first of all, we have several impacts on our world and one of them is the environmental impact. Uh, if you look at the construction industry, 40% of the energy usage comes from construction, from building houses and others. And 25% of the water consumption also goes to constructing and building 
affordable homes. And then 30% of our global waste, that's also part of that construction. So we have a big impact on our environment just with those three figures. And there is way more, of course. We also have a social impact. The, the amount of people on this globe are increasing dramatically. And we are, by the time we, at the year 2050, we'll be almost 10 billion people on this globe. So everyone needs to have a decent house to live in. Uh, everyone needs to have like a nice area, a nice neighborhood to live in. And that brings us to the financial impact. Financially seen, people that are developing a piece of land, they want to have the biggest revenue, of course. But at the other hand, there is a huge land scarcity at this moment. Uh, okay, we have a big globe and there is a lot of nature. We could all say, okay, let's build houses on that piece of nature. No, that's not the idea, of course, when we wanted to keep it sustainable. So buildable land is very scarce. And at the same time, housing is not a very affordable thing these days. It's a very expensive uh, way I heard in countries that a piece of land is becoming more expensive than the house itself that is built on it. So that's quite a worrying thing, I would say. So if we want to tackle those three specific impacts, then we can use the principle of what we call the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line is actually, it's, it's kind of a business concept. Uh, and the single bottom line is an easy one to understand. That's where firms only want to make profit. That's the single bottom line. But if you think about the social impact and the environmental impact and keep that in mind in driving a business, that's where you come with sustainable solutions. Now, specifically on the neighborhood, that's how we can define it, the neighborhood planning. So it's not just about building houses on a piece of land, there is way more around it. There's also like that social impact and that environmental and financial impact that needs to be included. So the typical process for neighborhood planning can look like this. There are easy parts of it, like defining the neighborhood boundaries. That could be by law, but it could also be by nature, like rivers or a natural boundary. And there is lots of things that need to happen before you actually get that neighborhood. Now, in this process, we are going to focus on the plan writing part, right? And the plan writing part has a few challenges. There, there is a lot of data available, so which is good because that's, that's not the challenge, it's, it's on itself. But the challenge in here is to gather all the data and to make sure that you use it properly. And data such as, for instance, the site boundaries. What are the environmental things, like rivers in the neighborhood? And where are they located? And the optimization of, of a lot is also taking a lot of time. Imagine that you have to plan for a huge neighborhood of, let's say, one and a half kilometer by, by 600 meter. By the time you have built four propositions, you might be already a month further. Right? So that takes a lot of time, and we don't have that time if we want to make something affordable. Lots of commitment, of committees at least, and local residents need to be involved in these discussions too. They need to be consulted, and they, we need to get buy-in from them as a land developer if we want to make sure that everything is working as we want it. And then, of course, social and economical potential is an important pardon here, but it's a challenge in a neighborhood because you need to make sure that the neighborhood is nice to live in, that people really want to live in that neighborhood, and that it's at the same time affordable. And then last one, last challenge is risk. Risks such as geotechnical problems, like what is the piece of ground we are building on? Do we have any problems in there? Uh, avoiding that we are building on a swamp, for instance. <laughs> Now, for urban design and development, there are lots of challenges too. So that's in general, that's not just the, it's not just the plan writing, but also the urban design. We face lots of things such as urban sprawl and uh, problems with public transport. We don't take into account the accessibility of public transport. 
or again, social aspects like making something comfortable to live in. Now, of course, it's easy to say sustainability is a challenge. It's a challenge in any type of industry. So it's something we all want to uh, achieve, well, want to be successful in, in sustainability. So UN Habitat came with a few rules on how to make a sustainable neighborhood. And we want to try with our workflow, we want, yeah, we want to try to meet a few of these requirements, right? To make sure that, well, the neighborhood we get is not just affordable, that it's not just a social thing that is nice to live in, but it's also meeting some sustainability rules. Now, why are we using generative design to do that? Why do we want to dive into that, actually? Well, this is how we used to work more than 50 years ago. Well, yesterday we talked about that and we discussed, and one was agreeing that this is like, oh, this, that was nice, especially because you were really working together in the same office and you could have some fun, maybe but it was not the most optimal, optimal way to work. So 40 <laughs> years ago, Autodesk came with, with, with AutoCAD on the market, and this helped to digitize, of course, those processes. We all know that BIM did, went a step further, and we made it possible to document IDs and to make sure that data was included in our IDs or in the documentation of those IDs to make it easier to deliver to site. Now, if we take the intelligence and the experience of, of building professionals and we combine them with the intelligence of a computer, that's actually the point where we can go into a real deeper, let's say, uh, a deeper technology and something that is helping us moving forward and being more efficient for generating options and making options that are relevant for us. And that's where generative design comes in. Now, it's not just about that process of generative design, it's also about how can we involve results. This is the example of what we used to do in the past with a project. We build something and then we test it. We see how is it performing. But then all the, the design decisions were already written in stone, so you cannot do anything with it anymore. So then we came to the idea of, okay, let's have a check how a design will perform before we built it. And that works quite well, although it needs a lot of effort. You need to put in a lot of data in your model to make sure that you can analyze the model, that you can find some energy problems in it, for instance. So what we need is a statement that helps us with what is the best design. So not how it's performing only, but also which one is best performing. And that's where we can involve generative design and stuff like Spacemaker very hard in. Now the process of generative design is not just a computer that is running. It's not like a few clicks on a button. No, it's a process where people are actually really hard needed because it's still people that are building the intelligence behind the generative design script, right? The computer is only used to run things, to make sure that everything goes faster. Now the process itself, and that's actually the the, the scheme that we are going to use for the rest of, uh, of our workflows. Uh, this looks like this. So we, we start basically with gathering data. And from that data, something will be generated, a model, for instance. And with the thing that is generated, you analyze that specific option. You analyze the design. And you get results for that. You get metrics. If you have metrics, you can rank it. You can say, okay, this design, that's a number one. This one is a number two. This one, well, yeah, scrap it. It's number 100, for instance. So we use ranking methods to define the best design, right? And generative design itself is going to take those results and evolve it. It will 
use specific algorithms, genetic algorithms, to make better solutions, to make different inputs, create a new model, analyze it again, rank that one. Until you get a final set of solutions which can be explored, visualized, and which finally will also be integrated into the final solution. Now the process itself looks like this. So this is a bit of what we call a satellite overview. That's actually the process for this whole neighborhood optimization. It's huge, right? And I guess you can barely read it, especially in the back. So that's why I'm going to zoom in a bit. Now, it's a very important thing that if you try to build your own generative design script, that you first start in mapping out your ID in, yeah, in such way. Try to use all kinds of tools that make it possible to generate those kinds of diagrams. Visio is, for instance, an important one uh, in there. And this can help you a lot when you start building yourself such scripts. So in our case, we gather a bit of data, going to, bit, going to explain this a bit more in detail later on. And with that data, we generate a specific developed piece of land with multiple lots and buildings on it that are gathered together in a dictionary. They are analyzed, ranked, and then we use the evolved technology within generative design to get better solutions. And in general, GDIR stands for Generative Design in Revit. This is then used to explore all the results and then send them back later on to Revit, SpaceMaker, and even Civil 3D. So the overall optimization workflow looks like this. We start with taking the boundary from SpaceMaker. So SpaceMaker is used to prepare the sites. We import the existing site conditions from SpaceMaker into Revit do some generative design magic on top of that to generate all kinds of solutions and select a proper solution that is then brought back to Revit and from there on brought back to SpaceMaker to do further analysis. That's the whole overall workflow. Now if you have a look on a, a detailed version of the workflow, so we call it uh, boots on ground, the first step, as I told you, is SpaceMaker, so preparing the site. And to prepare it, it's actually quite easy. You don't need to know much except for the location you want to develop, of course. And in this case, uh, I used something very nearby the neighborhood where I live in Belgium. So it's a very nice area along the river, uh, lots of green, lots of cows uh, eating grass and then a golf court next to this place. So if I once Won the, win the lottery, I might buy that piece of land and build those 800 houses on it. I don't know. The, <laughs> the place call, is called St. Martin's Lierne for those who are interested in it. So you're probably like, what? Which city um, or village? Anyway, once we get that data in here, we can ask SpaceMaker to extract the buildings or at least take the buildings, the existing buildings into it, take the existing roads, and use that information to actually set your buildable area, which is going to be showed a bit later on. Now, in this case, you can also indicate what type of roads these are. How many cars do we have on those roads per day? Uh, how fast can they drive on that? And this is kind of used then to perform noise analysis. In our case, we are not doing this noise analysis, but it's something handy to do when you have a bit more of bigger buildings. Now the red zone in here is the buildable area. So this is the area that needs to be developed. And at the same time we have this dark blue zone that you can see on there. That's actually something we indicate as like a view area. It means that afterwards where we come in with our solution, we want to see how much buildings have like a really nice view to that river. Because on that river you have like plenty of those nice yachts, big parties on it, so everyone wants to see it. So, and before we dive into the dynamo part, we need to have that information inside of Revit, of course. So it's not just SpaceMaker only, we need to extract that. So from within SpaceMaker, we load the extracted information in here. So the end of the previous video showed you that export to Revit and was like putting everything into your clipboard and then sends it in here into Revit. So you get the topo surface, you get model lines, that are indicating the buildable areas. So that means that we have like nice reference elements now that we can use in Dynamo to process 
the whole thing on it. And Jacob, you are going to tell us a bit more about all of that, right? Yeah, yeah. So the next phase is to figure out what kind of buildings we want to place. That's a pretty big ask, right? Are we doing towers? Are we doing commercial? What is it? And the best source of this data, if you're at a firm that does this type of work, is your previous efforts. Uh, so what uh, we're using to sort of drive our building types is actually our previous efforts. We've put together an Excel spreadsheet that gives an ID tag to every single building type we want to place, give it a type, sort of a description, if you will, uh, define how big the lot wants to be in terms of its width, define how big the lot wants to be in terms of its depth, and then starts to define the building shape. The way we're defining the building shape is by taking these values, these XY values, so our first point on this corner is x0, y5. Our second point is x10, y5. Our third point is x10, y15. Fourth point, x0, y15. That series of values then get serialized right up in there. So there's all my x values, there's all my y values in that sort of list format. We're then gonna eventually read this content into Dynamo and with those x, y values, we can generate points in Dynamo. And with a series of points chained together like that, we can generate a polygon. With the polygon, we can extrude it and we can get a solid. So with those values plus our building height, we've got a solid that defines everything we might want. And I wrote a little bit of Dynamo to sort of extract that from a couple of sites and it winds up that's a little bit hard but it's actually to do sort of automatically but it's really easy to do manually, right? Just draw a quick polygon. You might already have something that indicates your building envelope. Just extract the data from there. Uh, but then after that, we also need our driveway because we need to know where, building, where cars are getting to and from the buildings, uh, as well as a color value so we can quickly identify which type of building this might be. Uh, you can set those color values to be whatever makes sense. You know, in our case, uh, type F are our uh, amenity buildings. Uh, so we're putting those as a bright blue. They really stand out uh, on the site. After that, we are gonna put in the data that we care to optimize for, for any particular building. In this case, we're using uh, net price and carbon our carbon and body carbon. Uh, so our net price, that's how much money we're gonna make when we sell that building. So when this is all done, we can sum up those values because we know how many buildings we placed where and we know the profit, right? We're also gonna do the same thing with carbon to know what our environmental impact is from doing all of this. We're not gonna stop there though, right? Now we've just got a dictionary of all the things that we can do and we're we just gonna pack them all? No, we're gonna be smart about it. What type of buildings do we want to put? We're going to put to be together basically a list of the order we want to place these buildings in, right? Come up with some kind of a rhythm. Maybe we're doing the, you know, a series of townhouses that all look the same. Maybe we're really varying it. You get to define that early on. And this is sort of an idealized mix. It's not necessarily always going to hit that mix, but it's going to do what it can to get as close to that as possible. We've got two different sets for these. We've got the perimeter set, which is going to go around the perimeter of the lot or primitively the overall site, and then we've got the interior set, and that's going to be what we use for sort of all the infill buildings as well. From there, we're going to go into building the graph. First step, we're going to import all of our data. This includes the site lines from Excel, or sorry, the site lines uh, from Revit that we originally uh, originated in SpaceMaker, as well as all of our Excel data. Then we're going to generate our site in Dynamo using our generate, uh, generation tools, analyze that site in data, uh, in Dynamo, uh, in terms of what that outcome was, right? How many lots uh, did we generate? What's the net cost, net carbon, et cetera? And then write that data back into Revit once we've picked out our option. Overall graph looks like this, right? So we've got kind of our, our five different parts there. We've got our data part. This is where our inputs come from, our generation, Analyze, rank, and integrate. Note that we are gonna use some custom nodes here. I like you guys, so I wanna make sure you have access to these. So we went ahead and we put all this stuff up on Package Manager but under the Package Generative Neighborhoods. You can download that package. It actually has the full Dynamo graph in there in the extras folder as well as all our templates and everything else that you might need. Uh, we also utilize the topologic package, which is the other thing to keep a uh, note of here. Uh, that's used for analyzing the uh, sort of transportation network. Uh, so you want to grab that while you're at it. Uh, if not, Workspace References Manager will say, hey, do you want to install this when you go ahead and open the graph? 
And that gets us to the first step of the graph. This is our input data. So you can see here, we're gonna take all of our external inputs, set our variables. These are the things that are gonna change within generative design and our constraints. The constants that may vary project to project, but we're gonna kind of set those up to be what they may wanna be, such as um, within our uh, external inputs, we've got stuff like reading the building types from Excel, as well as within Revit, selecting those uh, the site boundaries. Within our input variable and constraint data, uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna set up our entry controls. These are gonna tell it, define kind of where the cars come into the site, where the people get into our neighborhood. Our road width controls, this sort of controls how wide our major uh, roadways and minor roadways are, uh, as well as our uh, lot depth, right? Uh, after that, we've got these other two pieces, which are our block positioning. We've got U and V values for where our blocks are gonna start within the larger site and then our block leading edge selection. This is gonna be a means of selecting a edge around each one of these little sub blocks that our sub, uh, secondary roads are gonna be perpendicular to. Uh, after that, we've got our constraints. These are the pieces that are gonna be sort of locked down. This includes our, our public transit spacing, right? How far do we want to go in between bus stops? Um, as well as our maximum walk distance to public transit. And then our maximum uh, backyard uh, to south, backyard facing south deviation, right? Let's pop into the live demo. I'm gonna put this here for you next. So you can see I am in Revit here. We have a site, not the biggest site in the world, but it's not tiny either. Uh, and we've already got Dynamo open, so I'm just gonna tab into that. You can see it here. And we'll pull Revit off to the left and Dynamo up on the right. Zoom extents. And then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna open the neighborhood optimization graph. It's gonna take a minute to get everything loaded up here. Maybe a bit more than a minute. All right, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and make this nice and big. We don't need our workspace references and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull the library all the way over because we don't need to see that here today either. So you can see the uh, overall graph structure here, those same areas that we talked about before. We're gonna start by kind of going through and configuring our inputs. Uh, so first piece, we're gonna browse to select our Excel data. There it is, our building definitions. Uh, and then we're gonna set this button to say, yes, update Excel. So this is a little toggle switch that we built in that basically will say either update the Excel data or don't use the data that you might've already remembered. Since I don't have that data built in, we're gonna go ahead and uh, reference it in. And the other input that we have to modify is this one, and I do have to pull this back off to the side to pull that off. Of course, it's easier with two hands, there we go. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna select our site bounds. When we're done, we'll hit finish. And this is gonna update the boundaries uh, for our site within the rest of the graph. From here, the graph is ready to run. I'm just gonna double check to make sure we didn't set this to true accidentally. Yes, we're good. All right, so let's go ahead and make this nice and big and hit go. Data's been set. We're pulling the right information. There's some default inputs for where our road entry points want to be and all that. Uh, kick it off and let it run. It takes a little bit. This isn't a simple task, but once it finishes up, there it is, we just been generated an urban plan, right? Not sure, certain if it's good or not yet, but our first round of generation is done, as is setting all our initial inputs. First part of the graph is finished. So <clears throat> the second part is about model generation. And the model generation one is the green area you see over there. Now, it looks simple as it's only containing more or less 10 nodes. Um, it's not that simple, but the way you can make it simple for yourself is using custom nodes. And those are actually, yeah, well, this part is actually the engine of this whole neighborhood creation. Uh, these nodes come from that package that Jacob just talked about. And they create actually a final dictionary that contains all kinds of information about the lots that have been created. So the information that has been defined in the Excel list is processed now throughout the model generation and then gets back into a dictionary. 
Now this dictionary makes it easier then for your computer's memory. So you don't over run it, let's say, right? Now, what properties do we have in there? The carbon emission, for instance, of each of those lots. So each lot has a house type on it. Each house type represents a bit of a carbon emission. The net price, uh, all stuff like the lot surface. So what surface has been generated in here? What is the size of it? And all kinds of other parts that are in there, also objects itself. <laughs> So afterwards, we can process all that data coming from the dictionary and do several other things with it, such as the analysis and the visualization, which we will come to uh, a bit later. And actually, we're switching straight into the script again, right? Yeah, so we're going to take a quick look at how this breaks down. So there are really kind of three main nodes. So there's these three custom nodes that happen right here. Uh, the first piece, it's basically going to say, and you can sort of see it in the background here. We'll pan it up a bit. Um, we got to figure out where we're going to come into the site, right? And so this is defining the site entry points. We do this by taking a parameter around the uh, surface for our main entrance and our secondary entrance. We're then going to play connect the dots between those two, right? Those are, I'm going to use the mouse to signal here, but it's kind of tiny. Uh, entry one, entry two. We're going to come a little bit into the site. Then we're going to play uh, for, from the start, a little bit into the site from the uh, end, and then play connect the dots between those uh, sort of four points that we now have. And that defines our primary roadway, sort of cutting through the site, bisecting the site in most cases. There are a couple crazy site configurations that we've seen that actually generate up to four kind of main blocks inside. Um, they're rare, but we managed to make it happen. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, those were accounted for. So we've got actually ways to configure five different lots. Uh, the next portion, after removing the site uh, entry boundaries and defining uh, kind of our entry points, uh, is to define our perimeter lots. Uh, effectively, the way this works is it's going to take that sequence that we defined before for the perimeter lot sequence and place building one at the start of the first curve, place building two, building three, building four, and it's going to iterate over that, fitting the next building as long as it can. The first time it can't, it's going to pull that building out of the list and it's going to keep packing buildings until we run out of perimeter. Right? And it does that with an offset so that we've got all our buildings sort of facing into the site. If we were, you know, had a highway back there or lakes or whatever else it might be, uh, we decided to go this way. You might want to reconfigure this so that you can sort of face out. Uh, but typically, I find you don't usually in an uh, urban planning setting want people sort of their driveway off a major freeway or something like that. So typically, you want to have a separate entrance to those pieces. After that, we've got our interior lots. That's happening down here. Uh, and that basically works the same way, except we have a whole lot more inputs. Rather than just taking our site perimeter uh, boundaries that we had before, lot depth and lot sequence, uh, we're going to take our site entrances, our site boundary, our main road width, our interior road width, our lot depth, lot sequencing, the U and V position for our blocks, and the block leading edge selection. Basically everything. Once we get the site entrances uh, we're in that sort of boundary, we're going to basically define the uh, surfaces that are going to be our roadways. Right? We're doing this all 2D flat, so we can do basic offsets and then sort of merge our surfaces. And that's going to define those interior block structures. Uh, with those interior block structures, we're then going to use our leading edge selection. And we'll look at this block here. Uh, effectively, what it does is it says, if this is parameter 0, continue to march around until you get the parameter we're after, and then we're going to find the tangent direction to that. We then pick a UV parameter inside based on our block U and V positioning inputs. And that's where we're going to start our offset. And then we're going to offset by our lot depth, lot depth, road width. Lot depth, lot depth, road width, lot depth, lot depth, road width, so on and so forth on the positive and negative direction until we fill up the entire block. Use that to sort of segment stuff up, and now we've got all our interior blocks. Once we have our interior uh, secondary roads, we can start to once again lay those houses out along those interior roadways. Building one, building two, building three, can't fit building four, go back to building one. And that finishes up the uh, layout. We're going to take all the information that we just generated with our uh, perimeter lots and interior lots, combine them into one list, flatten that list, use a little bit of cleanup to sort of remove any bad results, and then set stuff so we can sort of pass out our clean results and uh, sort of clean review uh, off onto the next portion of the process. 
Now, after you generated the model, you need to analyze it because otherwise you cannot make any scoring system to your design. You cannot find out which one is now our best design. And analyzing is actually the biggest portion of this script because we want to analyze it for lots of things. Um, the possibilities in that are endless. You can do whatever type of analysis in there as long as you can measure it. So the idea is that you end up with a scoring, with a number, which could be zero, one, or it could be 500 dots, whatever. So the idea that we had in here is to evaluate four important parts. And the first part is the lot evaluation. And in lot evaluation, we want to find out what is the backyard orientation look like. So that's actually the, the moment where, well, my trauma of mathematics in high school <laughs> comes in here, which is vectors. I didn't really like vectors, but hey, I'm at Autodesk now, so I need to like vectors if I want to use Dynamo. So actually, it comes in very handy then, right? I use this also to tell this to my kids if they don't like vectors, and it's like, look, daddy uses vectors now as well, so it's useful. And what it does in here is these orientations of each lot is compared to the south orientation. And then in this case, we say like that the maximum deviations should not exceed 30 degrees. The moment it's above 30 degrees, we give it like a score zero. The moment it's like aligned with south, it gets score one. So, and if any, any, anything at least in between gets like an interpolated score. So this way, if you count up all those scores for each backyard, the moment you get like a super huge value, let's say 200, and you have 200 lots, then you know that all of your lots are like southly oriented. So that's a perfect uh, solution, I would say. Uh, other than that, in the lot evaluation, we're also looking and getting, well, the maximized amount of lots. Of course, we want to have like the most amount of lots on this whole site, of course. Uh, so that's an, an obvious one. But we also want to minimize for instance, the amount of custom-sized lots. A custom-sized lot is a lot that is composed by two leftovers from this whole generation, the explanation that Jacob just did, like we start with building one, then building two, three, four, five, and do that whole iteration until the parameter is, is used. Now at the end, you always will get like a leftover which is not like a basic lot, not a standard lot anymore. So we want to avoid that because the more customized things you have, the more different documentations you need to create for it if you want to build that house. And then two obvious ones, uh, of course, is minimizing the average carbon emission and minimize the net price, which is then again the result of the type of range that we are using, the type of sequence that we are using to place those buildings uh, along the parameter. The second evaluation is a bit more into sustainability, except for that average carbon, which is also sustainability. We call this sustainable areas. And that's we, in this case, we want to find a good balance of green area, road surfaces, and the total lot surface we have. Of course, if you maximize green area and you get like a site which is totally green, meaning there's no lots, there's no buildings on it, of course that's the best solution concerning green area. So you need to balance it, you need to make sure that the scoring system takes into account multiple factors and not just straightforward something to 100%. The third evaluation is the infrastructure. So the UN Habitat rules, they also ask us to find solutions where public transport is accessible. So in this case, we count the amount of bus stops and we try to minimize the infrastructure length. So not like long roads, but very short roads and make sure that every house is close to each other, let's say, and close to the bus stops, which is evaluated here in the public transport access score. So that's like a bigger part in the infrastructure evaluation we do in here. It's using topologic to calculate the shortest path between every sample point, those red dots, and the target point, which is the bus stop. So we then use some extra calculations to find out the length of each of those paths and, and try to find the average walking distance 
between every street, every house, and the public transport. The result of that is a colored map where you can see those colored lines showing the walking distances for each house. So the moment you get like a red zone, that doesn't mean there is traffic jams over there. That, <laughs> that means in here that we have, yeah, that the, the public transport is not accessible enough for that area of the neighborhood. So that, for instance, the walking distance is, in our case, above 650 meters. It's not a rule that's 650. It's just something we came up with. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. We were like, yep, yeah, among beers. Oh, what's the distance? Well, let's say 650 meter. Okay, good. <laughs> so everything which is within that 650 meter is getting a score one. Everything which is around 60, 650 meter is score 0 0.5, and all the rest gets score zero. So that's how you actually can evaluate all of that. And Jacob is going to show us how that looks like. So we're going to go in the same order that Dieter evaluated or presented stuff to us. We're going to start with the uh, kind of lot evaluations. Uh, first one up here is the analysis of how does it face south. So each lot has its own coordinate system. That's how we're going to sort of work at placing stuff on the site. Uh, and so we just basically take that coordinate system and pull its y-axis. We get the angle from the y-axis to the inverted global y-axis, and that's going to give us a value between 0 and 180. If that angle is less than or equal to our deviation from, we're going to go ahead and filter it out, uh, as well as basically kind of uh, mapping those scores uh, in between uh, kind of where they might stand, uh, and then sum up the basic values between 0 and 1 uh, to basically give us kind of an individual score uh, for each of the lots that's basically just been combined into that one particular value of 14.6 with this particular orientation. Uh, next piece uh, that we're going to do, <coughs> quickly review, is our uh, custom lot analysis. This is pretty standard. Uh, we're basically going to take all of our blocks and say, hey, is this a standard lot? Go ahead and count it, um, divide it up by the total number of lots, and that's going to give us a kind of a customized lot ratio of less than 1%. That's a pretty low amount of customization we're going to have to build or put in to get this, these buildings built. So we're looking pretty good there. And we got 137 lots, so that looks pretty good too. After that, we get into our building carbon footprint. Again, we're just going to basically pull that value, take the average. That's our average carbon footprint for this particular uh, for the lots in this particular design. And then net price. We're going to go ahead and take uh, the, uh, all the individual net prices, take the average, and that's our average or profit per, uh, per lot. Uh, down here, we've got our sustainable areas evaluation. Again, we're kind of looking at our green area. What's the overall surface area of our green area? Uh, go ahead and sum that all up, and then divide that by the overall area of the site to get, again, a percentage from 0 to 1 um, overall. Uh, we uh, then move into our next piece, which is our road surface score. Pretty straightforward. What's the area of all the road surfaces? Sum it up. Uh, and then uh, divide it by the overall site area. Uh, and then uh, last but not least uh, is our lot surface score. We're going to take all the lot surfaces, get the area from those, sum those up, and then that's going to give us uh, what percentage of the site is actually utilized for kind of rentable space. Down below, uh, we then get into our infrastructure. Uh, we're going to take the center line of all our roads, get the curve length, sum that up. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, public transit uh, points, go ahead and count those. And then the fun part. Uh, so this is the uh, evaluation of the walking distance from the selected sample points on the, along all of the roads to our different bus stops. Uh, so the way we're placing the bus stops, uh, it's basically even distribution around the main roadways. We're not going to put bus stops on a secondary road. That just doesn't make sense, right? So how, many, how far are people going to have to walk down those secondary roads and uh, down the street once they get to the main roadway to get to those bus stops is really what we're after. Uh, so effectively what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the start point uh, and end point of all of our um, pieces, prune any duplicates uh, to basically generate those sample points along every single road. And we're just going to do sort of ease and distribution of X amount of points along every given roadway. Uh, the more uh, sample points we take, the slower it's going to be because we're going to have more analysis to do, but the, also the more accurate our uh, content's going to be. Uh, so we're going to add those points to the start and end point of our roadways, um, as well as the, uh, the uh, 
start in endpoint of uh, kind of the main roads. Uh, so we do the secondary roads and the main roads separate right there, uh, and then add in the entrance uh, overall as well. Uh, we're going to transpose all those lists, add the entrance to the end, flatten the list, make sure we get stuff that's nice and flat in terms of our overall structure. Uh, go ahead and pull some parameters uh, evenly spaced at those pieces, sort those individual points along those uh, values because that's a nested list, prune any duplicates that we might have, and build some polycurves. Right? Uh, from there, uh, with our individual polycurve uh, that basically connects all the points in the sorted order, uh, we're going to pull out the individual curves, pop up here, and this basically curved network, it's kind of like the center line of all the roads connecting all the points along all those roads, uh, becomes our topologic geometry, right? Uh, so our uh, topology, it's basically references to geometry rather than the geometry itself, which makes it much quicker because I don't actually have to touch the geometry. You can just refer to stuff that we already got. We're gonna take those uh, topologies, which are all gonna be edges, convert that to a single wire. Wire is basically a connected series of edges. And then build the graph. This is gonna tell us kind of how far along any given, from the start, any two points within that uh, graph, we can figure out exactly how far we might have to go and which vertices would we have to go through. So we're then going to take all our uh, bus stop points and all of our sample points and find the shortest path along that graph from piece A to piece B. So those are all of our shortest paths for all of the individual bus stops and all of the uh, sample points that we may have. So we've got four bus stops, we've got four, sam four samples for each piece. We'll go ahead and pull that individual geometry out, get the minimum item by its curve length, take that walking path and use that for uh, display a little bit later on, and then down here just find out what that length is compare that to our overall walking distance, our maximum walking distance, take the average, and then that generates our transit axis score. Analysis is now done. When you analyze things, the important part is also visualize your results. So it's not just about the metrics, it's also about making sure that everything in your script has like a bit of a color, not just to make it fancy looking, but also to make sure that you identify your objects in there. And uh, in this case here, we use a few colors for uh, things like buildings and driveways. So each building got a building type. And in the beginning, we use that Excel file to define actually the color of building type A, building type B, and so on and so on. So this comes in very handy here because that way we can use those colors in the Dynamo interface and have those same colors in the Revit interface so that you can immediately identify which is actually, for instance, a amenity because that has a specific color, for instance, blue. Then you know, okay, all my amenities are uh, spread around in that area. Of course, lots gets created in there, make a bit of coloring in here, like make a bit of contrasting colors so that you can easily see your lots in there. The green area, roads, public transport access points, which are in this case uh, shown as those yellow cones. And then the walking paths, which I already explained to you. Now, uh, particularly here in those green area is that we use a bit of, a, a bit of deep, deeper colors. So there is a color range used for it, and that's with a purpose I'm going to show you in this result. So, the darker the green area is, the bigger it is compared to the whole site. So that's a purpose in here. The moment you get like those very light green areas, those are like too small. So they are green, but they are actually useless. So maybe it's better to not use that part of your green area and use it as a buildable lot or build maybe something else on it. Do a quick sort of review of what that geometry looks like in our design now. So we won't spend really any time looking at this. Uh, effectively, it's just get parameter value, set color, or geometry color by uh, name, uh, with uh, maybe one exception being uh, sort of the uh, roadway transportation network. We're gonna go ahead and preview this. We do tend to leave this off. Uh, you can see everything's looking pretty good. I don't have anything that's not green or yellow in terms of my transit uh, sample points. So uh, pretty happy about that. We can uh, just sort of disable this for now. 
And then we will move into checking out, I'm trying to find a space that has less nodes. There we go. Checking out some of our geometry here. Uh, so you can sort of see the way all those different colors sort of work out. We've got all the different buildings on site. You can see where the driveways are for each and every one of them. Uh, it's very clear as to, as Dieter mentioned, where our amenities are, uh, where our special sort of lot types might be. Um, also where our bus stops are. That's what those inver inverted cones are. Uh, and you can also see where I've got kind of the larger green areas. Those are showing up as those deeper greens, right, versus you know, that's probably just going to wind up being a highway median at best, right? Not much more we can really do there uh, unless we come up with another use for that. All right. Zooming extents and back to you, Dieter. Yeah, so the final part of the script is to record the results in Revit because we need those objects in there to, uh, for further reuse in uh, Spacemaker and then later also in Civil. So the parts that we are taking in there are those six objects. So there is an object for road surface. This is more like for the visualization of it. We are not doing anything with the road surface in Revit anymore. It's just like, yeah, to have like a bit of a reference. Uh, the road center lines are also generated in there as model lines. And the idea of that is to get those road center lines into civil to then finally also generate a road model from it with corridors. The building instances, that's obvious. We need little blocks for each building, uh, which then can be used as placeholders later on to, for instance, more developed projects. Like in this case, it will be a building object called building type A as a family loaded into the, the whole project. But then later on, we can also make a Revit project called building type A, which is like a very detailed version of that house, including the layout internally and so on and so on. So that's actually some kind of a cliffhanger to industrialized construction in the future. The green areas, just as a dump into Revit, but more for visualization purposes. And then of course the lot separation lines, which are then also can be used in civil later on for lot generation, for property lines generation. And then the lot areas, those are also giving like a spectacular result, I think, because this can be used then for make your development plan. So finally, we will come up with a result where we have schedule, schedulable buildings, areas, and those road center lines. So those are the three important parts of that uh, generation. So how does that look like for our uh, demo side, Jacob? Well, hopefully it looks good. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and zoom extents one more time here. And the key piece here is we have to st now tell Dynamo that, yeah, we're ready to interact with Revit. So I'm going to go to my data.gate node, which is one of the core nodes in generative design. Basically, anything that's after this node, anything to the that relies on this data, can't execute. Because this data, if, if it's, this gate is closed, it'll only ever feed a null. So we don't have to worry about those nodes being executed and taking a whole bunch of time to run. I'm going to pull Dynamo open over to one side. We'll leave Revit up on the other. Um, We'll hit run and see what happens. So uh, it takes a minute. There's a lot of stuff going on here, right? Because it's got to sort of generate all of our green areas. Again, that's a direct shape. Happens pretty quick, single item. Um, just basically dumps it in. Uh, after that, it takes a couple minutes longer because the next piece is going to be our roadways. And there's a lot more roadways than we've got before, as well as our buildings, which you can see have now finished as well. Uh, so each one of these buildings, once it finishes running all the way through, oh, that's weird. Usually this doesn't do that. Yeah, there we go. Uh, all the way through, this is actually uh, kind of Revit families, right? And you can see kind of how that content works. Um, they're real families. I can go and I can edit the family type. Uh, we've got parameters associated to them in terms of uh, their type parameters. So they're down here because that's consistent for every instance of that commercial property. It's always commercial, right? Um, same thing for the carbon emission, net price, so on and so forth. Obviously, you could put additional parameters to these if you wanted to sort of associate an, another design firm or a structural engineer or uh, owner or who you want to lease it to, whatever else it might be. Uh, you can start to layer in that data uh, because it's Revit. Revit's great for data. The other cool thing here is this is now Revit data. If your designer wants to start to make manual adjustments, why not? Feel free. It might not be as great as the generative uh, pieces, but you can always come in and evaluate it after the fact. So 
So when you're ready with um, setting up that whole script, before you plug it into the generative design interface, which uh, we are about to do here, uh, these are five important steps to keep in mind. Uh, first thing is like verify your inputs. Make sure that your side boundary uh, is a closed boundary, that's not just an open line, because otherwise it won't work. Make sure that you refer to the proper path for your building definitions file. Uh, and more important here, that the Excel update is closed. You do, it, you do your Excel update before you run the whole generative design script, and then it's getting stored in the data remember nodes that uh, Jacob showed in the beginning of uh, the live demo. The third one is also, well, as you told, uh, you just opened that gate to generate the Revit objects. Before you run it in generative design, you need to close it again, because generative design cannot generate the buildings constantly in your Revit model for all those thousand options can only generate it for the moment you have found your proper solution, right? So that's when you open that gate then. Make sure your family templates are referred in the proper way because you use a specific template, a building type template, uh, that is containing already those parameters, so they are pre-populated. So in this case, we offer you this building type template, but it doesn't represent that much, so you can, of course, plug it in with your own uh, building type as well. And then, of course, save the graph. Now, there is some additional things that we're doing in there. This is just for your reference that we've put this slide in. It's quite a complicated thing, but it's actually to clean up your dictionaries in case there are errors. So we don't want errors in uh, those, uh, those generated lots, because sometimes you, you can get results with empty lots or lots that look a little bit funky. So we don't want to have that. So that's why we clean up the dictionary so that generative design will only come with proper valuable solutions and not like the invalid things. So uh, Jacob, you are going to show us a bit more about that interface of uh, generative design, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're gonna do, just in the interest of time, because we're down to the last 15 minutes, I'm not going to go through sort of closing the gates and stuff like that. I'm just going to go ahead and close this and say no. I had it set for generative beforehand, so I don't need to worry about it too much. Uh, and we'll actually just close uh, Dynamo as well, since we're going to be going into generative. So uh, to start, we're going to go ahead and sit, hit Create Study in Dynamo for Revit. We'll choose our graph. Once I get a good view here. Oh, I have to undo too, don't I? all the way back to the blank version of the file. So this is the study type that we're gonna go ahead and run. And then it's time to basically start uh, up, fill out our parameter information. Whoop, this is not a US keyboard. I can type better than that, D-E-M-O, there we go. Uh, and uh, we can choose to randomize, uh, sort of space it evenly, uh, optimize the results or do like this. Uh, we'll talk about optimize since that's probably the most uh, complex. We'll choose which inputs we want to vary. We could turn off any particular one if we were like, no, nope, it needs to be this particular value, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, but we're going to keep all of these variables that we've configured as being variable. Uh, the one thing that we do need to do is we need to go ahead and set this. Define our lots and then select our view that we're going to use for um, uh, generating the individual pieces. That's actually supposed to be the area uh, plan. Lot plan, yeah. Hmm? Lot plan. Lot plan, yeah, I'm looking for it. There it is, lot plan. All right, uh, so that's going to be the area plan that we're going to create the lots on uh, for scheduling our lots and information like that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just minimize these because I like small, less stuff exposed personal preference. Uh, then we're going to choose which goals we care about and whether we want to minimize or maximize them. Uh, background orientation score, right? obviously we want to keep that uh, down low. We want to maximize the number of lots. Uh, customize lot ratio, we want to minimize that. Average garbage, we want that low. Average price, we want that high. Green area, we probably want that higher. Road surface score, we want that lower. Uh, lot surface score, probably want to have a better percentage of the site be lot than not. Uh, infrastructure length, smaller. Number of bus stops, smaller. Transportation access, probably want that smaller. Yeah, smaller. Uh, and then number of filled lots, uh, we're going to try and minimize that as well. Uh, we'll skip past constraints and then set up our generation settings. We could do a 20 by 10 study. Uh, we could um, do, you know, whatever it may be. We're not going to hit generate though. I'm not going to lock up the computer for the next 
couple of hours um, just because it does take a while. Um, why don't we talk a little bit more about the process from here? Yeah, here. so the good news is we recorded the generator. So <laughs> um, actually, let's go back to that neighborhood we took in that fancy place in Belgium. Uh, how does that look like then when we want to run that optimization on? Well, so I told you that we took that site from SpaceMaker, brought it into Revit, and then this one is then going to be taken into that Dynamo script that is running behind the neighborhood optimization in here. So it's a bit of the same as Jacob just showed us uh, in here. So it's the same principle. You select the boundaries, you select the view where you want to have your lot areas on, and you select also your inputs very carefully. In this case here, um, we will choose to, for instance, not make the public transport spacing variable. That was that value of 650 meter that we discussed in Marcross Beers. So, like, let's do it. Um, also important in here is that you don't have to choose every parameter uh, or every output to be optimized. You can also ignore them. So you can also say, like, don't optimize towards that maximum or minimum uh, value, you can just have it as an informative output so that, so that you can use that for filtering out the results. So this is the process how it takes and so yeah, obviously speeding up, um, but it was quite okay. It took two hours uh, on a Friday afternoon even, so that went very well. I um, was really happy with that and it was like last Friday, <laughs> just before we went to uh, AU, so it worked out fine. Now at the end, you get with like maybe hundreds of results in here. So we don't want to evaluate all of them and review them. So what you need to do in here is use the filters that you get in, this, in the interface. So there's plenty of methods for that. You can use the tables, you can use the thumbnails, you can use the diagram below, or you can use that plotted diagram in here. So in this case, we decided to filter on the number of lots, the backyard orientation, and of course the carbon emission. So if you filter them to say that it can only show values between this and that and then make sure that all the other parameters are also taken into account, you end up with those four results. Now at the right hand side you get more insight of the chosen result. What is then the, the transportation score I get in there? What is the backyard orientation score that I get? And it's also nice to, that you have the chance to uh, explore a bit uh, your, your design, your finalized design. Now in our case, it's a huge site. It's more than one, one kilometer wide and, and 500 or 600 meter uh, in, in width. So yeah, that's of course a big site to evaluate in that little tiny <laughs> box, right? But in here, it's not about how it looks like, it's about the metrics. Those are the most important ones if we want to get into that sustainable neighborhood. Now, once you took your selection, we told you that that data gate was closed, so it cannot generate any Revit model. So that's why we have that little tiny blue button at the, at the bottom telling us create Revit elements. And that's actually the part where it will take that whole design and then run that specific part of generating the road surfaces, the roads, the houses, the lots, and so on. And then you get to this uh, part of your result with, of course, every parameter uh, being filled in. So everything is nicely populated with additional values in there. And uh, at the end, we get also um, this automatically generated lot plan, which is looking like this. So the moment you make sure that all of your view settings are properly done in Revit, you get these nice colors in there that indicate which are the biggest lots, which are the smaller lots. The moment you have objects in Revit, you can make a schedule of it. You can schedule those parameters, filter among them, and document them in, for instance, this nice uh, lot development plan, including each lot number, its properties, its area, and so on. So that makes it possible to continue from there and do other workflows even, and use those little families that we uh, made in there as like placeholders for bigger projects that you put on that same uh, site, for instance. So this is an example of how an area plan could look like, how the lot development plan uh, can be documented and be shared. Uh, yeah to the people that want to buy a piece of land in there. 
Now there was lot, one little thing um, we had in there uh, when we generated the buildings, and that needs a bit of correction, right? Uh, yeah, just a little thing, nothing too big. So um, what we had in here is that those buildings, they are generated on the model lines that come from SpaceMaker. So um, with a little tiny script, you can make it possible to drape those buildings on that topple surface. And the reason is uh, because if you take model lines into Revit, uh, they cannot drape on a topple surface anyway, right? Unless you would create those little tiny segments of it, but then you end up with millions of lines in the Revit model, which is not going to work either. So this is like an easy fix to make sure that all the buildings are at the right uh, level. And this is important because we need to take that information back to SpaceMaker. You don't want to have floating buildings in your <laughs> SpaceMaker model. Skyhooks. It, it might be fun. Maybe it's something for the future. So this is a temporary workflow we have in here then. <laughs> now, the way how you bring it to SpaceMaker is through IFC. Very simple. We take the building or we make sure that we have a view with only the objects that needs to be exported, which are in this case the building blocks. And then we export it to IFC with a setting where you take it like only the visible elements in that view. That's it, nothing more, nothing less, very easy. And the moment it gets exported, that's the part where we are, which is going to make it exciting to get it into SpaceMaker and do proper analysis, right? So what are we going to analyze in SpaceMaker? Not all of it, there are hundreds of design uh, analysis uh, possibilities uh, in there. So we are just going to focus on these five things, like what is the buildable area we have in there? Uh, how does it look like concerning sunlight, daylight? Uh, what view to the specific river area do we have for each building? And do we have any wind problems maybe in the newly generated neighborhoods? So you remember this part where we, yeah, actually our first video, the prepare, the prepare site video. Now this is going to take now that IFC back into SpaceMaker with all the results from the buildings. And uh, the nice part in here is that SpaceMaker recognizes each of those building shapes. So it's going to transform them into native SpaceMaker objects so that you can also split each building in levels because the buildable or the living area, let's say, that you have for each building is depending on the amount of levels you have in there. It's not like just the ground floor. You have a first floor, second floor, third floor maybe. So that's a very important part to make sure that you can analyze that, that you can have a review on it. Now, the analysis uh, in there itself, I think it took maybe two hours, three hours to get all the results. Not just like one analysis, but also for instance, the wind analysis that takes the longest time. But yeah, two hours, that's nothing for uh, performing like a computational fluid analysis uh, or at least type of analysis. Um, within here, that sun, uh, sun exposure uh, gives us a bit of insight on is it actually a good score that we got for our backyard orientation? So you get like more real values about it. Also, for instance, yeah, this little house, it's a bit unfortunate how it's positioned because it's uh, in between two of those big townhouses. So the architect might need to find like a different solution for that house and for instance, making use of, of glazed walls so that it has like enough daylight inside. And then also the, the view to that uh, river uh, is an important part. And like I told you, there is a lot of yachts uh, passing by there. So everyone wants to have like this nice view. And as you can see, the first four rows of that neighborhood have actually quite a good view uh, to that place. So that's, that's kind of okay. It's obvious that the, the, the buildings at the back will not have a best view, that's normal. Uh, so, but it is what it is. Another little problem we found in here uh, in our uh, neighborhood generation is that the wind can be very nasty in here. Uh, that's mainly because of the orientation of that whole site. So uh, what you could say is, for instance, in the, in the, new, in the next generation uh, of generative design is to, for instance, only generate buildings that are like perpendicular to, that, to the length of that site instead of following the full length. So this way you can avoid those uh, typical wind tunnels you get in there. Now we didn't just do this with this one single site. 
because that would be too obvious and you could make your Dynamo script working like for a specific thing. So we tested it on multiple sites. Uh, there was, for instance, this one. Uh, it looks like a spaceship, but anyway, it means that you can build something on a spaceship. <laughs> um, so it's not a, even a real project. This was just like, okay, let's test it. Draw a few lines and then see what it comes out of it. And no problems in there. So that means that at least we can use several site boundaries. Uh, this is another little project, which is called Star Mountain. It's, it's a little site, a little neighborhood uh, in the Netherlands. So quite easy to, uh, to use uh, as well. And then another site we took uh, north of London, uh, a site called Mansfield Park, uh, which is bigger than the one we used in the whole workflow. So these, uh, in this one, I think there were a bit more than 900, 900 buildings that have been developed on, on that specific site without any problem. Now, depending on the complexity of your site, the generative design routine will take a bit longer, of course, to run. Uh, but see, if you have to do this manual, you will never get to the time of four hours to come up with four or five proper design options, of course. Now, what's next? We don't just stop with uh, this part of the analysis, Jacob. Uh, yeah, we're, you came up with some good ideas uh, when we discussed this. Yeah, yeah. We're, gonna, we're gonna keep going. So, generative design doesn't have to stop just because you got results from generative design. You can keep using the tool. First place we could use it is optimization of bus stop locations. I mentioned before, we'd just evenly space them around our main roadways. That might actually be the worst way to space those. It might be better to sort of say, hey, let's put, I know they're a little bit closer if we put them like this, but it's better for all the people who have that really long walk. It gets to be a shorter walk as we get out towards the ends based on the profiles on our site, right? So we could optimize the location of our bus stops. Optimize our front yard plants. You know, one way to cut down on wind score is set up some trees, right? Uh, or maybe you want to make sure all your garden gnomes face the right direction. You know, it's up to you. Optimizing park access, right? We talked about walking to bus stops. Why not talk about walking to green space? How long is it going to take somebody who's in one of those center interior units to get to a green space of a given scope so that they can walk their dog or their cat, apparently, in this case? And then op optimize our op infrastructure layout, right? We could look at optimizing the power grid. How do we want to sort of orient that, making sure we've got some redundancies built in with the least amount of cost in case of emergency, flooding, whatever else it might be. Optimizing water distribution, storm water drainage, et cetera. Optimizing the location of the fire hydrants so you don't have to walk your dog quite as far every day. Whatever it may be, we can start to get to that content. You are really limited just by your imagination. Understanding what it is that's important to you, your firm, your clients, and how to turn that into math. There are th some things we can't turn into math. Is the building pretty? I, I, don't, I don't know how to score that, right? But a lot of things we can, and if you can turn it into math, you can optimize it. And what we also did on that site is an additional type of analysis, which is called uh, Autodesk grading optimization. And, um, this extension within Civil 3D makes it possible to find all of those lots and to see where can we create a perfect cut and fill um, to uh, come up well, at least with a sustainable solution again, to level all those building paths. So the lot areas that we got in that Revit model come in very handy here because we can export them to DWG and then import them into civil uh, together with the digital terrain model that comes from, from Arcus here in this case. Based on that lot areas, we can create the building paths and then that information can be used to perform that grading optimization thing. We just did it in a very small way. So just a little part of that site uh, was run through grading optimization for the simple reason that it's a very heavy calculation. It's not just like click and then in an hour you have all your results. Actually, I started last Friday at Cloud PC uh, running the grading optimization for the full site. Uh, the last time I checked was, uh, was yesterday and it was still running. So, um, and the reason for that is because these kinds of problems is not something you analyze in like one time. It, it's not a good idea to have like a full site of one kilometer by 500 meter 
to optimize that level in there because you will work in zones anyway. So it's better to perform that grading optimization in zones, which are we doing here as well. So we take that bottom block and then only those 125 lots or more or less, those are evaluated and then optimized in terms of their level on that site. So we want to end up with no transport outside of that area that needs to come in with extra ground that we can reuse everything of that site uh, to level up every, uh, all the other uh, paths in here. Um, so handy about the grading optimization is that you have like this slider to scale a bit like the differences in your terrain. It's not that it, this terrain is super bumpy, it's just the scale that you use into it so that you can easily see how it is actually performing uh, the levelization in here. And then during the optimization run itself, you can clearly see which parts are going to be leveled up and which of those parts are going to be leveled down. Now at the end you get this a uh, nice diagram telling us how much we uh, optimized in there and actually the, the cut has been used exactly the same or at least the, exactly the same volume from the cut has been used to fill uh, all the, uh, un, well, to fill the, the, the rest of that surface uh, area. So to close down um, this workflow well, this part of the workflow, it's not an ending story yet. Uh, the idea is to extend this workflow with multiple other uh, workflows and attach it even to other workflows. Um, so we limit it, well limit it, uh, ourselves with uh, just Spacemaker, Dynamo and Revit and Civil, but think about possibilities of BIM Collaborate Pro in this uh, and Build itself and Docs is also going to play an important role for future workflows that we pull uh, in here as well, it's together with some industrialized construction workflows. So that's probably going to be the next step for next year uh, at AU. Now this slide is also an important one for you guys. Yeah, I see it in your face. You all, you all <laughs> wanted waiting for this slide and then going to run away. <laughs> um, that's actually where you will find the contents. Um, after the class, I will put everything on that specific link. So right now, if you open it, you will see an empty folder. Uh, but if you give me like a few more hours today, uh, the folder will be populated with the PowerPoint and with the, including the videos. We also are recording this session. Uh, it's a bit, well, it's just with an iPad and, and with Camtasia in here. But anyway, it's recorded. So we will share that recording also in that folder. Keep an eye on that in a few weeks. Um, the data set itself will also be in there so that you can play uh, with all the stuff that we just showed you today. And uh, yeah, we hope that you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to us if you have like any problem with it. If you say like, okay, I'm trying this out, but it doesn't work. Uh, we're happy to get feedback from it and to improve uh, where we can. But also, uh, I don't know how it uh, works this year concerning evaluations uh, at, uh, at AU, but the moment you get a request to give uh, this class a score, please review it, give us some feedback on it so that we can uh, use that feedback for next year's uh, version of AU. And that's actually honestly that Jacob and I are allowed again to, uh, to come to <laughs> AU. So. <laughs> All right, and uh, I think we are Nicely on time, so again, perfect. So we have 10 minutes left for all of you if you have uh, questions, so, and we are happy to answer them. That said. Thank, thank you. Uh, that said, since we're recording, if you do have a question, we will ask that you speak into the microphone. So any questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, very nice presentation. Um, I guess my, my question, I was gonna ask if you had tried to put um, topography into the workflow, um, but now that you mentioned that, that you got it from Civil 3D, I guess my, my question would be, do you find that it, it is more uh, efficient to do the, the grading optimization part 
in civil 3D rather than in generative design because um, so in in my I work I work at a construction firm so what we have done is we have like really early developments with layouts for industrial parks um, so mostly when they have sort of a complex uh, site that has a complex topography. Um, they want to know oh, what's the cheapest way to, you know, have the optimum, like the optimum level of the platforms for each building. Um, so we built uh, a little script so that we would put uh, the topography and then we'll put the layout and it would tell you, you know, like the optimum level, with, yeah, the optimum level with the maximum balance possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've, we've done it in generative, like really high level, um, but it's in, interesting to me to see it in civil 3D. So my question is, do you think it can level up to get some sort of the same results in the same workflow or should, I, should we try it separately? <laughs> so I tried it. <laughs> it worked on a site that was about a third of the size of the site that I showed you right, where I've got like 10 pads. And it was also, took the graph runtime from what you saw to like 10x what you saw. And so when I go to three times, 50 times, 100 times the size of this site, suddenly it doesn't work. <laughs> and as Dieter mentioned, you know, even with computing up in the cloud, strong systems, optimized to do just one thing. It's been running for a week almost, right? So to try and evaluate the entire site for Topo as you're doing this, it's not feasible at this time. That said, you never know. Maybe we'll come up with an algorithm that just sort of manages to do it piece by piece and closer to functional time. Uh, but right now I would say, yeah, just use the purpose-built tool where you can. So that's because... Um, you have a lot of small sites, right? Uh, yeah, it's because of the number of pads. Um, but also because, like, <laughs> topo optimization is actually really hard. It, it's a lot of, because you're talking about non, well, segmented solids are difficult to calculate volume on, and you're modifying those segmented solids, right, in terms of where your cut and fill goes. So, yeah. I think that's a Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. All right. Any other questions? All right. Then we give you five minutes back. So <laughs> this gives you uh, some time to relax and go to the AU party. We will be hanging around there as well. So feel free to uh, to connect with us and come up with any of your ideas you want to share with us about this. Yeah. So, and again, thanks for staying here until the end of the class, so that's really nice. And that's the last day and the last session of the day. To the last of the whole five conference. minutes, yeah. So, great, thank you. Thank you.